Okay, Hans Sharon, happy birthday to you. Uh, a very important uh, German architect. Uh, Bernhard Hans Henry Sharon was born, as you see, on the 20th of September, 1893, and died in November 1972. He was a German architect best known for designing the Berliner Philharmonia, home to the Berlin, Berlin Philharmonic, and the Schminke House in Löbau in Sax Saxonia, in Saxony. He was an important exponent of organic and expressionistic expressionist architecture. Sharon was born in Bremen. After passing his abitur in uh, Bremer Haven in 1912, I guess that's the baccalaureate, Sharon studied architecture at the Technical University of Berlin until 1914, so just for two years. But he did not complete his studies. He had already shown an interest in architecture during his school years. At the age of 16, he drafted his first designs and at 18, he entered for the first time an architectural competition for the modernization of a church in Bremerhaven. In 1914, he volunteered to serve in the First World War. Paul Krüchen, his mentor from his time in Berlin, had asked him to assist in a reconstruction program for East Prussia. In 1919, after the war, Sharon assumed responsibility for its office as a freelance architect in Breslau, Brocklau. There in Easterburg, um, he realized numerous projects and organized art exhibitions, such as the first exhibition of the expressionist group of artists, Die Brücke in East Prussia. Uh, Die Brücke, uh, truly a very important uh, art movement by some uh, brilliant, um, uh, brilliant artist. Uh, Brücke means bridge, the bridge. So he, he, uh, his architecture was described in these terms, the eccentric democratic architecture of Sharon. Usually what is eccentric is not democratic and what is democratic is not eccentric. But in his case, it seems he was able to um, uh, marry the two. Uh, this was the man, uh, an intense man, uh, and uh, smoking, smoking like uh, other uh, famous architects. Not a cigar, but uh, a pipe uh, uh, or a cigarette. Uh, and uh, so architecture as resistance against Nazis, the challenge of Hans Sharun. A very, a very nice title, isn't it? You know, because not all, all architects resisted the, you know, the the influence and the, the constraints of Nazis, but he did. Uh, so, if it was just for this, and he should be mentioned, but he did much more, and you'll see a good number of buildings built by this very important uh, German architect. There are, of course, books, lectures, exhibitions about his works, and uh, you know, major buildings by him can be seen very well in Berlin today, and not only in Berlin. Drawings. Uh, he drew in an exalted way. Uh, there is indeed uh, expressionism. His architecture, the built architecture, is not as wild as his drawings, but his drawings do say something about Hans Sharun, no doubt. Uh, an aspiration, a dream, sometimes maybe even a nightmare. Uh, they, they express uh, feelings which are intense and uh, which he didn't want to hide away from. Uh, at the, that time, there were other German architects who expressed themselves in, in, in similar ways. But the, the, the drawings of Hans Scharun, uh, like those of Hans Pölzig or uh, Bruno Taut, um, have this uh, uh, exalted uh, um, quality, which uh, makes them uh, stand out, so to speak. So it, it was a freeing of the unconscious, in a way, through these drawings. 
I'm sure they realize that such drawings are not easily realizable, implement, they are implementable, but they still made them because they expressed an inner content which needed to be expressed. Now, these are drawings uh, for the Philharmonic uh, building, uh, the building for the Philharmonic of, uh, or Philharmonia of Berlin, uh, plan and the section uh, rotated. Uh, I like these drawings very much, both of them. And uh, I like in general expressionism in architecture. And uh, for some reason, expressionism is not very uh, appreciated or uh, fashionable these days. Now, a residential building at the Weissenhof estate in Stuttgart. This is a colony of um, famous buildings by famous architects that were brought together. I don't know exactly how many, maybe around 20 architects. The site plan was drawn by Miss van der Rohe. Le Corbusier was also invited and other important architects. And this is what he built. Um, you know, a remarkable building, uh, explicitly modern, uh, you know, almost uh, 100 years ago, he built this. And yes, it is white, but not only white, we see redness there. And uh, that redness says, says, says something that, that whiteness in itself or by itself or only by itself was not enough for, um, for Hans Sharun. This colony can be visited if you arrive in Stuttgart. Uh, it's not too far away from the, from the train station if you arrive by train from the airport or uh, otherwise. And it is a remarkable colony of um, modernistic buildings. Now, of course, between this building and the drawings we just saw, uh, there is a distance. Uh, first of all, those drawings were uh, meant for buildings um, that were uh, public, not uh, private, not a, a small house, like in this case, even though maybe this house is not so very small, but still it's a house, it's a private house. The Germans had uh, some uh, very important architects uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they are a little bit less known than they should be uh, known, in my opinion. So this is a fragment of the, of the of Weissenhof colony, whose planning was done, as I said, by Miss van der Rohe. And here you see the architects who contributed to, 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 this, uh, to this colony. Le Corbusier uh, was here, as you can see, um, and you, you see where it is um, uh, placed. There are, you know, Walter Gropius. Um, what other names do we see here? Peter Behrens, uh, Miss van der Rohe, uh, Bruno Taut, Victor Bourgeois. You know, there the were remarkable out, uh, the remarkable architects here, Hans Pelzig. The best of the time, here is Hans Sharon. This is his, uh, his building right here. So this colony uh, continues to exist in, uh, in Stuttgart. A brilliant idea to, 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 to bring together brilliant ar architects to, to, to create each one of them a building. And uh, thus, you know, to have a, a museum in open air, so to speak, of uh, remarkable uh, uh, buildings that try to bring in the new men's hostel for the Werkbund exhibition called Hochnung und Werkraum, Dwellings and Workplaces, Workspaces in Wroclaw in 1929. This is in Poland. And this building also shows uh, clearly uh, the exaltation Hans Sharun was capable of when, when he felt it was needed. 
but his buildings are uh, both, uh, you know, uh, balanced and exalted. They don't uh, totally give themselves to the god of intoxication, to Dionysus. But this part, at least, uh, you know, does express uh, indeed uh, exaltation. But not this part. So you see, there is a, a duality here that that Hans Sharun was 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 capable of both uh, both attitudes, a moderate one and an exalted one. No computer at the time, of course, uh, all drawings were done manually, but uh, it doesn't matter. A creative uh, uh, architect can, uh, can do wonders uh, even with the simplest means. And you don't have to write the, you know, the numbers uh, with a template. Even if you work manually, you can write them, you know, uh, informally almost. It's okay. The building is good, in my opinion. Uh, even using today's standards, I think it's it still has a freshness, a vision, uh, and a cohesion that uh, didn't age. Now, apartments at Kaiserdam in Berlin, Charlottenburg, 1928, 1929. Uh, I mentioned again that in 1928, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was built. So it was uh, built almost simultaneously in apartment, an apartment building, the white one that you see. And uh, again, when you think about it, that it's 100 years old, uh, <laughs> You know, if you build this building today, it would be considered, uh, you know, uh, right, rightfully belonging to our time. But it was built 100 years ago. Now, of course, 100 years ago, the sky was not like it. It is shown here in this image, but uh, thanks to Photoshop, uh, all kinds of eccentricities are possible. Uh, another uh, apartment building, uh, you know, uh, modernistic, optimistic in a way, uh, democratic indeed. I don't, I wouldn't really call it this one eccentric, but democratic, yes. As apartment buildings should be in general, actually, because, you know, they are public housings, they are, they, they, they are meant for a multiplicity, for a multitude of people. Town planning and housing design at this uh, Siemensstadt, 1929-1931. Uh, Here he also built uh, several uh, blocks of flats, you know, kind of uh, different from what we see previously. Uh, of course, they are taking, taken care of, uh, they, are, they are refurbished, they are, uh, you know, with affection uh, taken care of. Uh, as opposed to other places in, in Europe and in the world where older buildings are not so well taken care of. But in Germany, as you can see, uh, there is a difference, although not always. I mean, I have seen in East Ger former East Germany, old uh, railways, uh, railway stations uh, totally in ruin, totally, you know, uh, unkept. But that was East Germany with its famous um, communistic agenda, which, anyway. Another building by, uh, by Hans Scharun. Uh, he didn't build just apartment buildings. You will see other, other programs, uh, very interesting, you know, cultural, uh, educational, 
uh, he built a lot. Here we see in this, uh, in this uh, uh, you know, unfortunately the resolution is not great, but we see some of the architects who contributed to this uh, uh, large complex of buildings. Berlin uh, um, did something, uh, uh, you know, similar in a way to what uh, Stuttgart did in, uh, uh, you know, with the Verbund uh, colony that we saw. Berlin did it, did it, it thri uh, three times in the 30s, in the 50s, and in the 80s. Three times this very important city invited very important architects to build very important buildings for housing within the city. Not uh, something to be ignored. Even Le Corbusier built one of his four Unité d'Habitation in Berlin. Uh, and there are other famous architects, like in the 80s, you had uh, the elite of the, well, unfortunately, the postmodern architecture in the world building there. Then in the 50s, you had even Oscar Niemeyer and Alvar Alto and Bakema and uh, Walter Gropius. And in the 50s, I already, in the 30s, I already showed uh, some of the names. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it is remarkable, this uh, devotion a city like Berlin um, had towards uh, the quality of architecture and also the, the quality of the involvement of the important architects with social issues, because they built uh, apartment buildings which were not meant for an elite or you know, for, uh, for uh, people uh, very well to do, but for so-called normal people you know, maybe even underprivileged. And I think this is a challenge that uh, good architects should, should always uh, uh, address and uh, accept. So you see there are some names, uh, Barning, Otto Barning, Hugo Herring, uh, uh, you know, Sharon, uh, Gropius. And they, it, it, it's beautiful to have, you know, a colony of, uh, of works by such architects, uh, which, um, you know, uplifts the spirit. And uh, here they are. Gropius did these buildings. Uh, then you have this one by, uh, by um, uh, Otto Barning. Uh, Hans Sharun did this one. Uh, I wonder if he did also this. Sharun, yes, he did this as well. So this is the Sharun corner. And then who else is here? And in the Hugo Herring, Hugo Herring did uh, just all of this. Hugo Herring, a very important architect uh, who had the courage to um, uh, oppose Le Corbusier at uh, a session of the SIAM, uh, Congrès International d'Architecture, because he advocated an architecture that was not following the dogma of I don't know how many points, uh, but was a more uh, uh, organic, uh, maybe in a way more modest, um, uh, more intimate architecture, uh, and not one born from an abstract program, be it even uh, written by a brilliant man like, uh, like Le Corbusier. Anyway, the Schmincke house in Lebau, this is a very famous house, maybe his most famous, the most famous house that uh, uh, Hans Sharun built in 1933, five years again after uh, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was built, but it's very different from Villa Savoie. And look at this. And, you know, even if you are not uh, uh, temperamentally, uh, you know, seduced by uh, expressionism, uh, here you, you, you cannot deny the value of um, expressivity. And, uh, you know, this expansion of the house towards the garden, towards, um, towards the outside. So this is uh, the Schminke house in Lebau. Again, a very important house by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Hans Sharun, probably his best known uh, uh, house.
Now, the dualities of his architecture are shown here too, because you wouldn't expect, you know, this image to belong together with this image for the same house, but they do. Now, of course, because of the uh, sloping uh, piece of land, this was possible, but still the surprise exists because this side of the house is rather, you know, uh, moderate in spirit. It's not, uh, it's not eccentric. It's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, entertaining uh, the illusion of uh, an excessive, uh, uh, you know, expression of, uh, of uh, feelings of exuberance. It's just in a corner and from a certain uh, position, from a certain point of view that you have that, you know, as I call it, uh, exaltation. It's an interesting house because I think it is a balanced house. It is in a way, I almost feel like saying maybe a little bit simplistically that it's both Apollonic or Apollonian and Dionysian. And this is, uh, true in, uh, in some other works by him. It's a balanced, if I am to express myself uh, paradoxically or oxymoronically, it is a balanced um, exuberance. It's organic. But it's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, just so-called organic. It's ex it has a moderate expressionist, but no, no, I, I wouldn't use actually the word expressionist uh, with the sufficient confidence in the case of his architecture. It has elements of like here in the corner, but otherwise it's a house that, uh, is, uh, is, is balanced, it has an equilibrium, and it's even rational to an extent. But there are these uh, surprises even inside. Look at this, uh, look at this ceiling here, you know, uh, and he seems to like the tension between the white and the red, which in uh, European alchemy means the, the tension between uh, the masculine principle uh, red and the feminine principle white. Red symbolizing the sun, the king, fire, uh, and uh, white symbolizing uh, the moon, water, and uh, what else? The moon, water, the feminine principle, yes. The, there is a portion of the, of the natural world, so to speak, uh, brought inside the the room inside the living room. And this is also interesting in a way, you know, to have a, a portion for a, for a greenhouse, part of the, uh, part of the living spaces, uh, part of the living room. And here you also have a contrast and maybe this is a touch of uh, a little bit of expression is the, 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 the chromatic uh, tension between the green of the plants and the redness of these, uh, uh, circles uh, on, on, on the ceiling. I'm not mentioning the redness of the sofa because the sofas, uh, I mean, the sofa and the armchair maybe do not belong to what he imagined for the house, but to the clients of the house. Anyway, uh, but look at, uh, look at the ceiling, you know, uh, and even the floor, it, it has a, uh, you know, a certain uh, uh, graphic, uh, uh, movement that um, you know is 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 certainly not uh, uh, a placid flooring. Interesting architect, and the, the, even today, you know, almost one hundred years later, this building I think uh, emanates a freshness, a vision, a youthfulness. It is a young building still. And this is the power of art. And this is the power of the good architecture. It doesn't really age. Look at the entrance, you know, it becomes an event in itself. Otherwise the building maybe is not very eventful in, you know, at least in this area. But, but the exaltation of this canopy, 
the redness of these you know vertical elements on both sides announce you that you are entering a house which was not designed with indifference that's what it announces and the opening of the house towards the outside here in the proximity of the greenhouse also uh, adds to uh, uh, the temptation to 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 interpret the house as a uh, protective uh, enclosure but also as an architectonic organism which is aware that it does not exist by itself but it tries to communicate to an extent at its extremities with the outside at the entrance and here at the edge of the building through these stairs and balconies and terrace and so on and any good architecture i think finds some kind of a balance between introversion and extroversion Now, where you have a lot of glass, you also need a lot of radiators <laughs> because a lot of glass means losing energy and losing heat. Uh, so you need the radiators, of course. I don't know if so many as he placed here, uh, but they, are, they could also act as a handy uh, bench or a place to rest on if there is the need. Anyway, the beautiful green of the trees, which we need so badly in our world. And uh, another view of the house with a greenhouse and the entrance. And the plan, uh, the second floor. interesting this uh, this room here which is i guess a guest room where it seems if i'm not mistaken that uh, this is a bathroom totally open towards the towards the bedroom which has two beds in this way with a bed right in the center of the room which is unusual uh, although i see here I don't know, maybe could it be this is not a, it's possible, it's not a bedroom, but I don't, I mean a bathroom, I don't know what it is, because I see here an access to, uh, you know, quite a general space for uh, for uh, bathing. So this is probably something else. But what is unusual is, uh, is this bed placed in the center of the room. Very rarely you would see something like this especially if it's a twin size bed. And uh, I guess what, what is there that I thought initially it's, it's this sofa, maybe it's, it was not, it's this one here. Let's look again. Yes. And we don't see the, the bed in, in the center. Uh, anyway, um, you know, uh, so far with an unusual uh, shape because, uh, you know, it, it's not so exaggerated as in the drawing, but still it doesn't have the same uh, width. Anyway, it is an inviting sofa. I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, uh, having one myself. Uh, anyway, um, on the other hand, here I see actually two beds. Anyway, why should I uh, concentrate too much? I guess this one was brought here or something. Okay, the living room with the Kandinsky chair by Marcel Breuer, two pieces. Uh, what else do we see? The inevitable piano, which even Frank Lloyd Wright liked. Um, and uh, yes. Also interesting, this, uh, this stair here, the, the, the parapet, which is uh, eventful architecturally or in terms of design. 
it doesn't leave you indifferent. It's 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 different. It's uh, it has personality. And again, touches of redness with uh, you know preponderant uh, whiteness around. I like also the fact that the glass, uh, uh, you know, parts of the house uh, have uh, both larger pieces of glass and smaller pieces of glass. Here you can open the windows, so it's not just uh, you know an air-conditioned house. You can also bring in uh, fresh air from the outside. You can ventilate uh, the house naturally by opening the windows. Now, another house in Berlin, Spandau from 1935. Uh, here we almost see a certain uh, attempt to negotiate between what we call tradition and one, what we call innovation, because there is a sloping roof. Uh, and it might be that uh, when did he build this in 1935? At that time, already the, uh, you know, the political powers were, um, uh, promoting uh, the great virtues of the fatherland uh, and um, thus, uh, you know, uh, an increasingly uh, intense uh, interest in, uh, in uh, so-called uh, the tradition of Germany, the, you know, the, even the vernacular architecture of Germany and so on. So for an architect like Sharon to function in those years, he probably needed to assume to an extent, although you see his architecture is resolutely modern, but in order to function in that uh, political climate, he probably had to make to an extent some concessions to her, uh, towards uh, you know, looking backwards a little bit. So I guess we could interpret certain things in this house in this way. And I think I'm going to show another example, at least uh, uh, kind of similar. But the plan uh, shows uh, the ability of Hans Sharun to assume levels of exuberance, which uh, are not normally associated with what we call uh, tradition. So he designed, we have seen um, the public housing by Hans Sharun. We are seeing now private houses by Hans Sharun. So he worked both for the public and for the uh, for private uh, uh, commissioners. So again, if we look at the uh, top part of the house, we could almost say that the house is uh, moderately, uh, you know, uh, making concessions to what we call tradition. But on the first floor, things are different and certainly on, on the plan. Look at this. And in the model, model this is seen even better because you wouldn't expect to have this image uh, looking at the plan and looking at the first floor. But the top part, indeed, I think shows a certain um, uh, attempt to not infuriate perhaps the spirit of the time, uh, which was uh, dictated by uh, those in power at the time. The Mall House, 1936. Uh, also, here you see this visceral, uh, you know, coagulation of various spaces, the articulation of various various spaces is uh, almost visceral. And, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is not done now and it was not done then very often. So you see the, the, the house in its plans shows, uh, you know, uh, if not uh, uh, torments, uh, a state of mind which uh, welcomed or, or couldn't stay away from expressing conflict. 
uh, you know, conflictual uh, inner feelings. Uh, and uh, it's here we could talk about expression is to an extent. Uh, that there, there are tensions here in the plans of the house. In the section, as I see again at the top, the top seems to uh, try to pacify the, the, the agitation beneath. Sorry for the resolution of this, uh, of this image. Anyway, now, now the Romeo and Julia high-rise apartments in Stuttgart from 1954-1959. So the Second World War ended and uh, he was able to build now again um, you know, uh, public buildings. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, large apartment building called the Romeo and Julia. In fact, there are the two buildings. I believe this one is his too. And you can see that he was not, uh, he was not uh, tempered too much uh, by, uh, by the Second World War, that he still kept uh, trying to, I mean, compare these buildings here with these, which are his. It's a big distance, no? I mean, you know, immediately after the war almost, well, 1954, 10, well, almost 10 years after the war, but still the war, the Second World War uh, brought a, a huge shadow over Germany. And yet this uh, the creative force, Hans Scharun, uh, didn't, um, you know, uh, become mellow uh, at all. Yes, I mean, you know, by, by today's standards, maybe these buildings uh, do not look uh, outrageously, um, you know, uh, uh, exuberant, but uh, they have, they have, uh, you know, touches of uh, aspiring towards uh, a little bit of rebellion, if I can, if I can call it so. And I actually like the, the certain uh, ambiguity present here. You know, it's, it's, it's an architecture that is uh, not uh, screaming at you, here I am. But if you look more carefully, you discover elements of a, a personality which doesn't want to be uh, uh, unnoticed so to speak. I like this building, you know, it's, it has character and it has movement, but it's kept under, under uh, you know, uh, control to an extent. And look at the plan. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, architectures not very different from this in plan, but look at the balconies. The balconies are, again, uh, gestures of uh, attempting to communicate with the outside in uh, more uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, forms, if not uh, uh, exuberant. Dan? Uh, yes. The good good part i i can guess of this plan is uh, the central space it is open on both sides so it's not a dark dark uh, passage uh, if you see on the right side near the elevators and stairs there is a there is a balcony there probably and uh, yeah the the other end also has a stair so it's open there is natural light uh, second thing uh, what i noticed was when you enter like in a hotel room uh, the toilets are there near the main door and then uh, uh, the outside is left more to the bedroom and the uh, living room so they get the views uh, right. that's 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 what i marked thanks thank you vatsal it's a good observation that most of the time in uh, blocks of flats you know the public uh, corridors uh, within the buildings and also the staircases are not uh, uh, naturally lit and there is no ventilation but in this case there is and it's true it is important this a very good observation Vatsal. thank you so uh, yeah 
Um, so these, these, these were built after the war. You can see he also didn't, and I imagine that's how he uh, envisioned the buildings to have some color on them, which is also, uh, I would say, a, a good thing. Although we, we have seen buildings by him that didn't say no to whiteness. Now, another housing development uh, in the 50s, Charlottenburg Nord. Uh, look at this plan, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's alive. It's um, maybe a little bit too much, but uh, yeah, I think it, it has nerve. It has, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it's, not, uh, it's not at all a typical uh, apartment building. I even like the way it is drawn. I even like this um, scribbling here or this nervous line here. I don't know what it is. And I don't know if it belongs to him. I imagine it does. But this man drew this plan, you know, with, uh, you know, manual drawing, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's precise and yet uh, lyrical somehow through its uh, nervousness almost. And he seems, it seems he did it at once, you know, as if it bursted out of him. You know, it just uh, came out of him, this plan, in a moment of uh, revelation. Very interesting drawing, very interesting plan. It's very difficult to do something like this, you know, almost spontaneously. It seems it is done almost spontaneously. Somehow the plan is more uh, interesting than, uh, but it seems, I don't know, actually, there seems to be a distance uh, and even a difference between the plan we looked at and the buildings that they were built. So maybe that was just an initial sketch. Uh, and he built not just one, he built all of this. Yeah, I like more the, the plan than, than what I see here, I, I confess. Anyway, a girl's school. He built, uh, I will show, I think, two schools in this presentation, and he was very good at it. The same spirit of the plan we just saw is somehow to be found in the, in the, in the schools he built, 1956, 1962. Uh, and, and look at the plan. It's... Uh, it's, it, it's a school which refuses to be, uh, you know, dogmatically linear. Uh, it understands the value of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, privacy in a way and individuality because these classrooms are different from most classrooms in the world. Yes, there is a corridor, but uh, uh, once in the classroom, you, you, have, a, you have the feeling that, uh, your individuality is not betrayed, but expressed. And there are usually the, the public rooms. I mean, the, the, the rooms where, you know, several, you know, a multitude of people met have special uh, uh, shapes, you know, like this amphitheater. Uh, so it is organic and it is, uh, it has uh, touches of uh, a little bit of, uh, of a movement which might be described as expressionistic. Uh, it, it's a school that uh, achieves what I call multiplicity in unity. This is the model of the house, of the school. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe at that time that there weren't too many people who were doing uh, such, uh, such architectures for schools. And we are going to see pictures because it was built emergence of a social approach to school design, Hans Sharun. Um, so yes, his uh, interest in uh, democracy, in freedom, in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, the freedom of learning and the freedom to, 
to uh, teach uh, students not in an oppressive and dogmatic way, but in a free way, in a, in a dynamic way, is shown clearly. And, and uh, architecture can do this. You see, if, if, you, if you are taught in such a, an environment, I'm sure you, you become more open-minded and, uh, and uh, you know, there is a chance that uh, psychologically you might be healthier than someone who is uh, taught uh, oppressively in uh, typical rectangular rooms, uh, you know, all aligned uh, equally oppressively on a, on a dark corridor. There are spaces of interaction, you know, those uh, interstitial spaces, if we are to call them so, where people meet, children meet, they talk to each other accidentally, uh, chance encounters, these are important, very important. And look, uh, here you have the old and here you have the new, here you have the church, here you have the school. And in old times, in the Middle Ages, the, the, the church was uh, a place where education also took place. Uh, so I like this uh, proximity here between the church and between and, and, and the school. I don't know if the school belongs to the church. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have a dialogue here between two different functions and two different kinds of architecture, the old and the new. And it's very possible he didn't neglect or he, did, he was not indifferent to the proximity of the, <clears throat> of the church. In fact, you can see it on the model. You, you might say, well, you have the uniqueness, the oneness of God and the unness of, uh, of the children or the human beings. So there is a complementarity here, which I think um, is, uh, is valid. I, I like these spaces very much, which are undefined in a way. They could, they could function for various uh, you know, activities. You can sit down, you can talk, you can even study. These spaces which are not, uh, uh, you know, underlying for a specific function uh, excessively are very, very useful in architecture. Uh, and uh, I think the skill of an architect is shown in the way uh, he or she is, is able to address and conceive such spaces, the spaces of in-betweenness, which uh, most architects, good architects talk about in-betweenness. So we have here harmony through contrast. The church is done in a certain way, the school in another way, and they complement each other, the new and the old. This individualization of the classrooms is very beneficial because you identify immediately your classroom. You know where it is. It's also was connected with a courtyard, an intimate courtyard. So, you know, it's almost like it's your private home. The classroom becomes a home for these children. This is very important. And the, the amphitheater, which because of its function to bring together a larger number of people should have, uh, you know, uh, an architectural configuration which uh, generates, which illustrates and, uh, and facilitates interaction. Because it's the, it's the house of gathering in a way, uh, an auditorium, that's what it is. And this room expresses exactly this.
these diagonals also, in my opinion, encourage the students to appreciate diagonals, even in their so-called subversive function. Because the diagonal, yes, is rebellious in opposition to the Cartesian system. And if a child or an adult uh, acts diagonally, so to speak, in life, uh, brings in that, uh, uh, I would say, necessary rebelliousness without which life becomes a bore. You can see each classroom has its own private, it communicates with a larger space, but it also has the chance for, uh, for a more intimacy. This is very unusual for, for schools, you know, to have uh, each classroom with its own, uh, uh, you know, outdoor space. That's why I said each classroom is in a way the home of the children uh, who study in this particular classroom. Again, it's about multiplicity in unity, variety in unity. A good building. Bravo, Hans Sharun, and happy birthday to you again. Who cares? This was built, you know, 65 years ago or so. It's still uh, very valid. I wish there were more schools like this one in the world. Here he is. I don't know if inside this school or not, but um, the architect as a social figure is a reality or should be a reality. An architect should, uh, through the very nature of his work, her work should be part of society. That's because architecture is a social art. We have seen this picture or something similar, a concept inside the auditorium. And now the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, a very important work by him, if not the most important, or at least the best known work by him, a remarkable work. I didn't visit it, it unfortunately, when I was in Berlin, but I, 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 I was told that the ac acoustics are incredible and that uh, the, the, the music, musicality of the spaces is also incredible. This is the building from the outside. And if you are in Berlin, it can be visited. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go to a concert there. If, if, if there is a group of people, uh, you know, let's say students in architecture or architects, they allow you to, um, to visit the building. It is uh, 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 an, an excellent building and uh, you know, uh, it, it's, 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 it's both functional and lyrical. And, uh, uh, you know, this is not easy to do. We see, uh, you know, far away or maybe not so far away, the Sony Center by Helmut Jan in the Potsdamer Platz uh, by, um, uh, you know, uh, with new buildings, um, uh, in, in the center of Berlin. But this building by Hans Sharun still stands out. Again, his ability to, uh, to create uh, this conjunction between unity and, 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 and diversity. And maybe that's why he's called the architect of uh, you know, democracy. Because in a true democracy, uh, you have uh, one plus one plus one equaling three, and you do not have one plus one plus one equaling one plus one plus one, uh, nor do you have three equaling three. You have both one plus one plus one and the three. In other words, you have the unity and you also have the, the multiplicity 
generated by the sum of the individuals. Here, just like in the how in the in the school uh, we we looked at, there are islands of uh, you know uh, seating areas. So again, you don't belong to the typical. <clears throat> We have seen plenty of uh, concert uh, halls and uh, operas and so on. But here you have this uh, variation in the landscape, so to speak. Uh, and uh, this creates a sense of belonging to a place, an identity, which is important. They are together, but they are also together as individuals or individual groupings. And this is also expressed towards the outside. The building has variety, but also has unity. Dan? Yes. Uh, have, have you compared the interior of this one with the one by uh, Frank Gehry? Uh, if you go one slide back, probably. The one by Frank Gehry uh, for Disney, Disney Concert Hall. Uh, have you compared it uh, at any time? Uh, are they similar? No, oh, I, I didn't think actually of, uh, of Frank Gehry, but uh, it can be done, I guess, you know, but I think there are differences between uh, Hans Sharun and, and, and Frank Gehry. Of course, yeah. But it, it's, it's per, it would be perhaps interesting to, 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 uh, to discuss the works in, you know, to an extent. Hans Sharun is not so flamboyant and but uh, yeah, I will think about it. Thanks, Dan. Well, thank you. So it's not just inside the, the Know, the auditorium itself, but also the spaces outside with the with the stairs also having allowing for a certain degree of individuality and freedom. It's a very good building. And I regret I didn't go inside, although I was outside of it several times. Uh, sorry, I don't know what happened. I uh, I don't know what happened here. Yeah, you, you see how this interior is, uh, is, uh, is musical. That's how I, I, I would put it. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it is moving itself. It has its own dynamics, but not in a, you know, crazy way at all. It's, 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 it's moving, but uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a moderate way somehow. It's, this is really a, a great art to be able to, to achieve something like this. In other words, to be both uh, reticent and uh, exuberant. How could one be both? It seems he was able to unite the, the opposites, conjunctio oppositorum, if I am to use uh, the expression from, uh, from alchemy, to unite the opposites, yes. So he doesn't say 
no to this order when is the case, when it's maybe necessary, if we are to call it disorder. So, you know, for example, in this plan, there is even a part which is symmetrical, like here, if you, if you trace a, an axis through here, this room is symmetrical. But then we arrive here where all symmetry is gone. And in a way, appropriately so, because this is the ground floor where people meet. And uh, you know it's 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 really about conjunction. It's about again the house of the gathering. If I am to express myself, maybe rhetorically, is where people come together. And there, you know, inevitably, architecture should become itself, in a way, unstable because it's the instability of the human negotiations when a group of people, a larger group of people, uh, happen to be uh, together for a while. Dan, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just looked up uh, Frank Gehry's uh, concert hall, uh, Disney concert hall, and this one is, uh, according to me, much more dynamic than his. Uh, his is more formal this one is this one has many angles and uh, nice views i guess thanks yes it's it's uh, it's good that you mentioned this that um, yeah sharon is not a formalist i wouldn't describe him as a formalist he just he doesn't just play with the uh, angles or lines they they have a meaning they have even a a function and uh, thus he's not a formalist no Although, at, you know, at the first uh, sight, you might say, well, he's playing with the, with the forms. No, no, no. He, it's, it's much more than that. He, that's not what he does. A very good architect, Hans Sharon. Now, salute high-rise apartments in Stuttgart from 1961 to 1963. Uh, and look at the plans here. You know, again, the 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 uh, the, the exuberant uh, balconies. These are not very big apartments. You see, they are rather small. Uh, and again, like uh, Vatsal uh, mentioned, you know, there are circulations which give access to the apartments, which are uh, connected with the outside. Uh, and this is not a little thing. And if we look at the, you know, this is just a studio, but uh, it functions very well. Here is a one bedroom apartment. Yes, these are modest apartments, but modest apartments in an apartment building done by a skillful architect, a generous architect who understood that uh, even when you build uh, not for the privileged ones, for the 1% ones, uh, you can still do architecture, as he certainly did here. There are larger apartments, there are smaller apartments, there is a studio. Uh, all in all, the pleasure of doing architecture and serving society and serving people with the best you have, I'm sure he knew something about that pleasure. In the, in the process of uh, building this building, imagining this building, and uh, of course, not just this building. He was not dogmatic. You know, he, uh, you can see from his plans, from his uh, built architecture. This is okay. Maybe the building is a little bit extruded too much uh, vertically. You know, it's a similar plan all the way to the top, but you know, this is uh, in most, in many cases, almost uh, the case, you know, with uh, apartment buildings. What I try to say is that maybe the, the, the freedom of the plan is not so apparent uh, vertically, you know, the in section, the building doesn't seem to have quite the same spirit as the plan. But uh, again, this is, uh, if not almost unavoidable, but uh, always the, many times the case. And, and, and as such, the building represents 
you know, it, it's a building which uh, uh, proclaims, you know, democracy. Maybe the word proclaims is too strong. Uh, it uh, emanates uh, togetherness. There is a little bit of uh, variation and uh, freedom, so to speak, at the top of the building, as you can see. And again, he has this uh, attraction towards balconies, terraces, staircases that are well, uh, you know, uh, naturally lit and ventilated. And uh, this shows his spirit. He's uh, uh, communicating with the outside wherever he can. Now, uh, another school, um, and let's look at uh, one more time at this uh, apartment building uh, that he built in the 60s. Now, another school, a uh, main and primary school in Marl, designed in 1960, but completed in 1971. Similar to the school that we already saw, uh, uh, expressing the same desire to individualize the classrooms. I mean, they are, they, they are similar in terms of shape, if not identical, but they are identifiable because of the, the way he articulates the classrooms together in, in smaller, uh, you know, uh, groupings of people. It's almost like an educational village, if you want. And the collective spaces are, uh, you know, moderately dynamic. Uh, and things can happen there uh, informally that uh, activate uh, the desire for communication that uh, children should have and adults should have too. And uh, often maybe they don't because architecture does have an effect on the life of the people. It does. Uh, this is actually, sorry, from the, uh, the other school. It's not a pretentious architecture. It's not an architecture that um, makes you say, wow. No, it's a modest architecture, but within this modesty is the lyricism of an architect who did have, in my opinion, uh, a correct understanding of what life is and what society is, what human beings are, what children are, and uh, what education should be like. The amphitheater, again, it's a miniature, uh, you know, example of what he did at, uh, at the Philharmonic uh, building, the Philharmonia in Berlin. Uh, and then, uh, in a way, uh, these schools also, I mean, of course, they are made by the same architect, but they show the same preoccupation with the, with the private and the public. There are intimate spaces, there are larger spaces, but not oppressively large, where you can... Uh, Yet agoraphobia. Uh, it's it, it, this. These spaces, I think, are conducive to dialogue, to communication. You know, you sit on the bench, you walk up on the stair, you walk down on the stair, you say hello to each other. You see here someone else, you know, uh, descending or ascending uh, on this stair. You say hello. Here you engage in a conversation. It's really a space of uh, a space of togetherness, of communication. Also in terms of materials, because he uses brick, he uses concrete, he uses wood. So he's not inhibited and inhibiting. And the ceiling, you can see, is not always at the same height and is not, uh, you know, uh, boringly flat. Uh, there are slight deviations from the angle you'd expect it to be at. So here is the, 
Here is the school. You look at these apartment buildings and you, could, you look at the school and you would probably say these children who studied in this school might be a little bit freer as human uh, beings than the people who grow up in these buildings or live in these buildings. Because the school, without being disorganized, and it is not, it is ordered, but it also welcomes a certain degree of freedom, which I think we would all benefit from. Uh, sorry, I don't know why it disappears here. This is another apartment building that he built. Um, even here, we see the same uh, ability without uh, rhetorical means and without uh, bombasticity, if there is such a word. Uh, he is uh, uh, coagulating uh, an apartment uh, building and a uh, block of flats, which has some variety, uh, various heights. It has uh, cohesion because of the repetition of certain floors. It's both ordered and a little bit, uh, a little bit disordered, if I am to use such a word. Anyway, even the windows, you know, he is not using just uh, one piece of glass. You know, he is dividing the glass in uh, segments, in fragments, and you can open windows, which is very rarely the case in uh, in. Uh, in today's architecture where we rely excessively on air conditioning. Now the embassy building for the Federal Republic of Germany, now it's Germany, but then it was a divided Germany in Brasilia. I don't have, I think, too many pictures here, 1964, 1971. So he did the, the, the embassy for the Federal Republic of Germany. It's an embassy, okay, well, embassies are, you know, uh, institutions that uh, you know are governmental and uh, such maybe uh, uh, there are certain limits uh, to within which you have to 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 act you cannot make uh, an embassy uh, you know in uh, you know like a, like a building by frank gary i don't think frank gary designed too many em embassies in his life uh, anyway um but this shows again, you know, the reputation he had since he was commissioned to design uh, also an embassy of this important country of Europe. Certain uh, similarities with the previous buildings we saw can be seen here as well. Now, a city theater in Wolfsburg, in Wolfsburg, uh, 1965, 1970, uh, uh, 1973. You wouldn't expect to see a theater uh, look like this. It's so elongated, and uh, but it's the same architect. Now you could uh, identify, perhaps with a certain ease, a building by uh, uh, Hans Sharon. It's a little bit more, uh, you know, I would say a little bit less uh, lyrical. Uh, you know, he was getting old, I think. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, and now we look at the uh, German Maritime Museum, 1970, 1975. Uh, I, I wonder, I forgot exactly when he died. He died in the 70s. Maybe this building was even built uh, towards the end of his life or even after, uh, after, after he died, it was built. Now here, if I like something truly, <laughs> is this uh, large piece of wood more than the building. Uh, it's true, and we'll see another, uh, another you know, uh, displayed so-called object, this uh, old, uh, you know, ship, boat within the, the museum. It's the Mariti Museum. I don't, I don't look at the building, to be honest with you. I look at this, and uh, yes, uh, it uh, it amazes me, you know, the way human beings can can manipulate, can use wood wood to, uh, you know, uh, build a, a ship or a boat with so much uh, ingenuity and uh, hard work and so on. It, anyway, I like I like this I, the building itself, uh, and I like this uh, arm here. Yes, uh, the building is very possible. It was finalized. 
after he died. And it's also very possible, you know, approaching his end at an age which was already appreciable. Uh, maybe this is not, not one of his best buildings, but we are going to see another building, a large library. Uh, this one, the State Library, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation uh, in Berlin, 1964-1979. And it is indeed, a, look at this, it's almost a factory, the factory of learning. In the back, you see a building by Renzo Piano. And uh, yes, this is, uh, there are several buildings by important architects in Potsdamer Platz. So this is the, how is it called again? The State Library. The, the State Library, this is not a little thing, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. And you see, it's, it's, uh, it's a vast uh, space, uh, the space of learning. Uh, and again, we see his uh, uh, ability and his interest uh, in, uh, in, uh, in um, creating spaces that are conducive to uh, interaction, and uh, it's an open space, but I think uh, you can still find your, 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 your uh, table and, and chair where you could study uh, with a certain uh, level of uh, intimacy and peace of mind within this large space. It is a large space, but you can see there are several floors uh, that communicate and yet they have their own identity. Um, I think it's 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 a good building considering its size, for its function, a state uh, library. And it's not very different the architectural language from the the architectural language of the uh, Philharmonia. And I like the fact that circulation, stairs, uh, you know, uh, the relate the connection between various floors. All these things are are uh, somehow integrated within the larger um, coagulation of spaces. And so, you know, you are not separated, but but at the same time, you are not you don't lose your identity in an undifferentiated, large, if not huge, space. Uh, yet, it is a very large building. And it's just behind, the, I think this building might be by uh, Renzo Piano and all these buildings here to the left do belong to, I mean, he designed them, Renzo Piano, uh, together with a German architect. So here is uh, Hans Sharun again in Berlin. Thank you and uh, happy birthday again, Hans Sharun.